quite literally a military genius who used propaganda to boast his defiant acts. He was an optimistic man who seized power and would conquer most of Europe. This is, of course, Napoleon Bonaparte. Welcome to the channel if you're new here please consider subscribing it really really does make a massive difference if you're returning welcome back like comment subscribe let's get into this he was born napoleone on august the 15th 1769 in corsica to carlo and letizia he was the second son to the bonapartes his father was a minor italian noble who had rulership over corsica at the time napoleon's her father was fighting against the french for rulership over the island which would eventually see the Corsicans give up the independence to the French. Carlo integrated himself into his life with his French overlords, leaving his Italian roots behind, changing Napoleone Bonaparte's name to the more French-sounding Napoleon Bonaparte. This enraged Napoleon. He and his father would become estranged because he felt that his father had no dignity giving up his Corsican rule so easily to the French. As much as he hated his father, Napoleon loved his mother, who had eight children. She was strict and took no nonsense. Later on in his life, Napoleon would say that all of his successes were because of the lessons he learned on his mother's knee. Napoleon was sent to France for the first time in 1778. He was sent to the Royal Military College in northern France of Bringe, and he hated it, absolutely hated it. First of all, he could only speak Italian, so he couldn't really speak French to his counterparts. It was cold, so he wasn't used to this cold climate coming from a Mediterranean island. He was bullied because he was a scholarship boy, and he wasn't really French enough. So, uh, even though he had a minor nobility title, he was seen as scum by his more entitled counterparts. He was kicked aside by almost everyone. He became a loner. However, he did endure this. And one can see that this is perhaps where Napoleon gets his stubbornness from. By the age of 16, he started a military apprenticeship as the second lieutenant of an elite artillery unit. This is where he really came into his own. He was able to control both the men and the arms under his command. Even though he was developing quite nicely as a military leader, he realized he needed three things. Talent, which he had, but two other things. Money and position. Napoleon had neither. He was frustrated with this fact. He was getting bored and he wanted to be doing so much more stuff, but nothing was really coming his way. He needed something to change the status quo. Luckily, in his late teen life, this opportunity would be on the horizon. On June the 14th, 1789, a crowd storms the Parisian armory. They go to the prison of Bastille, free the prisoners, looking for more weapons. This gives rise to turmoil. Chateaus are looted. This, of course, is the French Revolution. Although Napoleon wasn't actually a revolutionary, he was kind of happy that this was happening. He was privileged, he was a minor noble, but he wasn't as entitled and as privileged as his peers. So this inhibited him from developing in his military career. And due to this fact, he was really happy that the status quo was finally changing. Maybe he could have an opportunity to develop in his military career now. In 1792, the French Revolution was succeeded by the Republic of France. And Napoleon wanted to have a role in this France. He wanted to be part of it. So he said to himself, I'm going to go to Corsica and gain all the influence in Corsica, which is now part of France, so that I can come back to France one day and have great influence. But the governor of Corsica said, you're just a little boy, go away. His family was sent into the mountains. They were seen as traitors by the Corsicans. This led him to flee Corsica in June 1793. And Napoleon declared himself as French and only French. Napoleon was then appointed as a captain in the military, sending him to Toulon to put down the rebels who were aiding the French enemy in their port, the British. The big issue was that the French city was being defended by the British ships who were anchored just off the bay. And Napoleon realized that there's a big power vacuum that all the aristocracy have left as the heads of the military, and he could fill it. All he had to do was win. He set up by training his troops, ensuring that they had what they needed to succeed, and we can see the loyalty of his men starting to develop. Famously, he said, morality of his men outweighs the materials needed, meaning he will always keep the morale high. On the 17th of December, he led his army into battle against the British. The horse that he was riding was shut out beneath him. He was sliced in the leg with a bayonet, but still he continued, eventually finding victory. 
Napoleon's first real victory, and he was promoted to Brigadier General. In 1795, he was then sent to Paris to put down a whole lot of mobs that were rising. Every time a mob would rise, he and his military unit would cut them down, decimating them, killing hundreds of Parisians. He loved it. After this, he was made a full general and granted supreme leader of the interior army of France at the age of 26. Due to his success, he was given leadership of the French army in Italy to fight against the Austrians in the Italian Alps. This was a massive opportunity for him. It was his first time fighting on foreign soil in Europe. But his generals there didn't like him. They thought he was a no-starter. Boy, oh boy, would they be proven wrong. It didn't start well for him in Italy. For the first two years, he got nowhere. Everyone got frustrated until Napoleon gave a famous speech. Soldiers, you are naked and ill-fed. No fame shines upon you. I will lead you into the most fertile plains in the world. Rich provinces and great cities will lie in your power. You will find their honor, glory, and riches. His troops had never heard anything of the sort, and they were entranced by their new leader. This increased the morale of the men, making them believe in themselves, training to get stronger and stronger, dominating everyone that came in the way. This made the rest of Europe very nervous. Of course, the European nations at that time were all kingdoms. They were all led by kings or queens or emperors or whatever have you. And they were worried that the French Revolution would spread to their lands and the possible execution of these kings and queens. So they needed to put Napoleon down. This meant that most of the European nations decided to declare war against the French Republic. Because of this, the French needed one unified leader. And the only person that was really going to take them to their victory was Napoleon. They fought in Italy, they fought in Austria, they even fought in North Africa. In reaction to the British on the 19th of May, 1798, Napoleon and 300 ships left Toulon to go to Egypt. At the time, the British Navy was the real superpower of the day. However, the French Navy somehow managed to get all the way to Alexandria and hoped to use Egypt for trade. Here, after the conquest of the Egyptians and the Mamluks and all the way up into Syria, Napoleon started the Egyptology Academy in Cairo, which helped the Egyptians find their Egyptianness, understand their amazing history, which had been lost to time. This wasn't just a bloody conquest. It was a scientific expedition. Horatio Nelson, Lord Nelson, would eventually find the British fleet in the Bay of Alexandria, and he destroyed them. The Ottomans and British unified their forces fighting against the French, and in May 1799, they beat them. The French military was in tatters. Napoleon realized that they had lost, and on August the 22nd, 1799, he fled back to France. Things in France were terrible. The Russians and the Austrians were threatening to invade. There was no money in the government coffers. People wanted to bring back the old royal family. There was even rumors of a coup d'etat. Napoleon's brother, who was part of the Grand Assembly, like the French Parliament, said, to sort all this out, we should vote in three consuls to get this mess sorted out. Oh, and one more thing, my brother should probably be one of the consuls because he's got the entire army behind him. As soon as this happened, Napoleon pushed out the other two consuls, he rewrote the constitution, and at the age of 30, he became the most powerful man in all of France. The country he inherited, however, was in Datas. The people were poor, they were divided, the living conditions were even worse now compared to pre-revolutionary times. There was such an enormous weight lying on Napoleon's shoulders. The Austrians, however, had other ideas and they decided to take back the lands Napoleon had won in the Italian campaign. So Napoleon had to deal with this first. He and 40,000 troops set out over the French Alps in the spring of 1800 to meet the Austrians in battle. Amazingly, this entire journey just took six days. Sure, there were some deaths along the way because of the rugged mountainous terrain, but this is an amazing feat. On June the 14th, the French and the Austrians met in battle. By the end of the day, there were 7,000 French soldiers lying dead on the battlefield, but there were 14,000 Austrian soldiers lying dead on the battlefield. The Austrians retreated. They ran away. They signed for peace within a year. At this time, Napoleon's powers were unmatched by anyone in continental Europe, except the British 
who at this time were at the pinnacle of the imperialistic empire and were immensely wealthy. They were the commanders of all the seas. On May the 18th, 1803, Britain declared war on France and against the little general Napoleon. With this, the Austrians declared war on France, saying that they're going to take back their land once more. And one more thing, we've got the backing of Mother Russia. This didn't worry Napoleon too much. On December the 2nd, 1804, Napoleon crowned himself as the first emperor of the French. The revolution had thrown away the old royalty and the kingdom was no longer needed. However, this ceremony was like a coronation of old Bourbon kings, except for one thing. Napoleon was the ruler and he put the crown on his head. His propaganda was almost otherworldly. He commissioned portraits, sculptures, pamphlets, which were everywhere so everyone could see how amazing their emperor was. Even before he crowned himself as emperor, he used propaganda to try to convince the public that it was their idea to crown him and he was just simply doing his duty. There was, of course, the job of warring and the battle with the Austrian continued all the way until December the 2nd, 1805, a year after his coronation, when Napoleon proved his military genius at the Battle of Austerlitz, where even though Napoleon had a smaller army of 68,000 men, he divided the Austrian army of 90,000 and conquered them by 4.30 p.m. With his tail well and truly up, he subjugated Prussia, who were the strongest army for 21 days straight after the Battle of Austerlitz. This would see Napoleon take victory after victory after victory for the next five years, and every single European nation would bow to Napoleon, except for one, Russia. On the 24th of June, 1812, Napoleon and his huge army crossed into Russia. The Russians simply ran away. They burnt everything that they could. Every time Napoleon would get to a town, it would be deserted and burnt. There was nothing for his troops to eat. Eventually, Napoleon made his way all the way to Moscow and he realized it's deserted and winter is coming. Napoleon nor his troops had the correct clothing for these intense Russian winters. When they did eventually meet the Russians, it was the bloodiest battles Napoleon had ever fought. One thing that he could always count on was the morale of his men, but that too was starting to disappear. Napoleon and his men decided to retreat all the way to France, but they were chased by the Russians. He set out with 600,000 men, but only 100,000 would survive the failed Russian conquest. For the first time, the little general was in trouble. His enemies were unified. Britain, Spain, Portugal, Prussia, the Dutch, the Russians, the Austrians, all pushed the French over the Pyrenees Mountains. In October 1813, there was the Battle of Nations, the Battle of Leipzig, which would see 38,000 Frenchmen die and 20,000 be captured. Napoleon escaped back to Paris, but he realized everyone had turned on him. His generals had lost confidence. The politicians didn't want him there. He was forced to abdicate, which he did so on April the 6th, 1814. It was agreed that Napoleon would be exiled to the Isle of Elba. And on February the 26th, 1815, after 10 months of exile, he decided he had had enough of this. So he snuck past the guards with some loyal soldiers and sailed back to mainland France. He decided he was going to go to Paris. However, a garrison came to arrest him. He didn't fear anything. He simply walked up to the garrison stating, if there is one among you who wants to kill his general and emperor, here I am. The soldiers who were sent to arrest him parted ways. They cheered for him and then they followed him to Paris. As he got closer to Paris, he went town to town, gathering up all the troops who defected from the royal military to Napoleon's side. At that time, the French government had called back their old Bourbon kings and Louis XVIII now sat on the throne. He heard of Napoleon's plan to come back to Paris and he remembered the days of his grandfather, Louis XVI, where he was decapitated. So he fled. Napoleon, on the other hand, was welcomed in Paris as a hero. The European nations were in shock and they realized they needed to destroy Napoleon completely to make sure that he would never rule Europe again. So they formed their alliances once more and created an army to take Napoleon out. It didn't take long. June the 18th, 72,000 French soldiers met 68 Allied forces at the Battle of Waterloo. Napoleon got to the battleground before the Allied forces. The Allied forces hadn't formed their ranks and they looked like amateurs. Napoleon thought he was going to win. 
It had rained the night before and Napoleon had a very strong cavalry unit and he wanted to use them. So he waited until midday so that the ground could dry out. But of course, this meant that the Allies got time to form ranks, to get themselves organized and give the Prussians an opportunity to flank Napoleon's army, which meant defeat for Napoleon. Facing his defeat, he was removed from power, forced to abdicate his throne once more, but this time there would be no return. He was forced into imprisonment on a remote island called St. Helena, which was a British colony. This man who really pulled himself up from a minor noble role had become the French emperor, the conqueror of Europe, but now he had been reduced to a gardener to read the newspaper and do nothing. He died May the 5th, 1821, most probably because of stomach cancer. For all his amazing achievements physically, he wasn't a born leader. He was five foot two, not overly short for his age, but by no means was he tall. He had pale skin, a fat tummy, a head that was too large, a short neck. He became a natural leader of men simply because of his cunning ability to make himself seem invincible. Thank you very much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. Like, comment, subscribe, the more you know. Mm -hmm.